Okay, guys. So welcome to the AFM final revision session today. Um, my agenda for the session of today is that I'm going to be uh, covering different uh, areas, different topics, which I realized from our yesterday discussion and meeting that uh, that uh, we are actually uh, we are actually that we are actually uh, going to be uh, discussing about those topics where I think that you people are struggling, right? So I would just go about discussing some different, different, different areas. And just in case, if you have got any queries or anything to ask, you're most welcome to go ahead and ask about them. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to discuss that was actually about the, um, that was actually about the bond yields. Now, there is something that I want you people to understand with respect to the bond yields. Uh, so with respect to the bond yields, there are multiple things that you should understand. One of them is that if you have to calculate the value of a bond, so how do you calculate the value of a bond? The value of a bond is present value of future cash flows. discounted using market rate of interest. The so value of a bond is what? It's a it's the present value of the future cash flows discounted using market rate of interest. That's one thing that you need to understand. Now, in a lot of situations, what actually happens is that the examiner actually gives you yield curve. What does he give you? He gives you yield curve. What do we mean by yield curve? So the concept of yield curve is that, let's say you've got different bonds, you've got bond one, you've got bond two, you've got bond three, you've got bond four, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You've got different, different types of bond, let's say. So if you've got different, different types of bonds, so what happens is that, let's say the bonds have a maturity like this. This bond has a maturity of one year, two year, three year, four year. And what happens is that the interest rate applicable on this bond of one year is 3%. Uh, this is 3.7%. This is 4.9%. This is 5.8%, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what you're going to do is that you're going to draw a diagram. And when you're going to draw the diagram like this, the curve like this, so what is actually going to happen is that you would say this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four. These are the different time periods. When these are the different time periods, so there is this, let's say 3%, uh, there is this 3.7%, there's this 4.9%, there's this 5.8%, let's say. So what is gonna happen is that you would actually draw, you would join them like this. So when you join them like this, this is going to be curved, termed as yield curve. What is it gonna be termed as? This is gonna be termed as yield curve. So we have this one, we have this two, we have this three, we have this four. So this is actually gonna be considered as yield curve, right? Yield curve, right? This is what is gonna be yield curve. So at times what happens is that when you are being given the yield curve, so instead of using the market rate of interest, what you do is that you use the yield curve to discount the cash flows. You use the yield curve to discount the cash flows. Now let me just guide you people a bit that how it goes about. So if I talk about uh, the cash flows, uh, it is going to be like this. Say uh, year, cash flow, the discount factor, the present value. So whatever time period, one, two, three, four cash flows are, they're gonna be discounted at 3%, 3.7, 4.9, 5.8. So you would say 1.03 power minus one, 1.03, uh, 1.037 power minus two, 1.049 power minus three, 1.058 power minus four. So this is what the discount rates are gonna be. This is how you will do it. So just in case if you come across such a question where the yield curve is given, so in order to deal with the yield curve, what is gonna be the approach that you would adopt? You would adopt this approach that you would say that, okay, 
uh, the cash flows are going to be discounted using these different, 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 different discount rates. Now let's move a bit forward and let's discuss further. <clears throat> so I've actually explained to you the concept of the bond yields also. Now at times what happens is that the examiner would require would would actually give you the government bond yield curve. The examiner would at times give you the government bond yield curve. Now when the examiner would give you the government bond yield curve, so he would say that uh, the yield curve of the government bond is year one, year, the rate. One, two, three, let's say 3%, let's say 4%, let's say 4.8%, so on, so on, so on. And then what he would do is that he would also give you a table. He would also give you a table. The table would actually be like this. The table would actually be like this. Let's say year one, two, and three. Then he would say that, let's say triple A, double A, A plus, B, triple B, so on and so forth. And then he would actually be mentioning about, let's say 20, 40, 90, 120, let's say 35, 75, 125, 180, uh, let's say, um, 70, 120, 190, 250, so on and so forth. <clears throat> now, what is this all gonna be? These are basically considered to be, these are basically whatever this is given, these are actually considered to be the credit spreads. What are they considered to be? They're considered to be the credit spreads, right? What is it gonna be considered as? it's gonna be considered to be the credit spreads. Now, when we talk about the credit spreads, so these credit spreads are actually expressed in terms of basis points, in terms of basis points. And what happens is that 1% is equivalent to 100 basis points, we call it BIPs, BPS, the 100 basis points. So 1% is gonna be 100 basis points. So let's say, for example, for example, if I have say that my bond is double A rated. If I say that my bond is double A rated, so what am I gonna do with this bond of double A rated? So with respect to this bond of double A rated, what am I gonna do? I'm actually gonna say that the double A rated bond is gonna be like this. Uh, we would say that uh, 3%, 4%, 4.8%. 3%, 4 4.8%. 4%, year one, year two, year three. You would actually add up, add up the credit spread, which is 0.4%. 1.2%. Hence, resultingly, what's gonna happen? Resultingly, what's gonna happen is that three plus 0.4 is 3.4%. Four plus 0.75 is 4.75%. Four point eight plus 1.2 gives you 6%. Right, this actually gives you 6%. So what would you do if you have such a bond? You would actually discount such a bond using this yield curve. You would discount such a bond using this yield curve. Why? Because this is gonna be the relevant yield curve for the double A rated bond. How have we established it? We have established it by using what? By using uh, the government bond yield curve plus the credit spreads. Now let's move a bit forward. So I talked about the yield curve. Does any one of you have got any questions with respect to yield curve? If you've got any questions, you're most welcome to ask or else I move forward now. Yeah, if any one of you have got any questions, please do ask or else I'm gonna move forward now. <clears throat> okay, 
Now let's move a bit forward and let's discuss further. The next aspect of the scenario is that we have to talk about, we have to talk about the concept which is termed as the free cash flows. I bet we have to actually cover up the concept which is called the free cash flows. So let me just discuss about this concept of free cash flows that what exactly are the free cash flows and how do we establish the free cash flows. So let's have a bit of a discussion about it. Okay, so with respect to the free cash flows, what exactly is the concept of free cash flows? The concept of free cash flows is the cash flows available after fulfilling all needs of the business. So whatever the business needs that are there, you have to actually incorporate them and the cash flows that are gonna be available after that, that will be termed as free cash flow. What is it gonna be termed as? It's gonna be termed as free cash flows. Now, if I talk about the free cash flows, the free cash flows are actually of two types. I bet the free cash flows are actually of two types. Now, what are those two types of free cash flows? Let's try to understand them. The two types of free cash flows are that Whenever we talk about the free cash flows, the free cash flows are the free cash flows to firm, which we call FCFF, and the free cash flows to equity, which we call FCFE. So there's a free cash flows to firm, there's a free cash flows to equity. When we talk about the free cash flows to firm, the free cash flows to firm is the cash flow which is available for distribution to providers of finance. And when we talk about the free cash flows to equity, the free cash flows to equity actually means the cash flows which are available for distribution to equity providers. So there is this free cash flows which is available for distribution to the equity providers and the cash flows which are available for distribution to the uh, overall providers of finance, which is the debt and the equity provider. Now, let's try to understand that how do we actually go about establishing these uh, free cash flows. So when we talk about the establishment of the free cash flows, the establishment of the free cash flows are actually like this. Uh, for the free cash flows to firm, what do you do? There are actually two methods of free cash flows to firm. So when we talk about the free cash flows to firm, the free cash flows to firm are established like this. You say profit before interest and tax. And on this profit before interest and tax, whatever you do, you apply the tax, let's say at the rate of 30% whatsoever. So directly apply tax on that. Once you apply tax on that, so what you do is that you would actually end up getting profit before interest and tax one minus T. Hence, then what happens is that you would say non-cash, non-cash expenses. Like the depreciation, et cetera, et cetera. And then what you do is that you deduct uh, any investments in non-current assets that you make any investment in working capital that you make. So what you do is that you deduct that out of it and resultingly, what do you get? You end up getting the free cash flows to firm. End up you getting the free cash flows to firm. What are these free cash flows to firm? These free cash flows to firm are the cash flows that are available. The cash flows that are available for distribution to the finance provider. So what do you mean by finance provider? That means the provider of debt and the provider of equity the provider of debt and the provider of equity. As you know that these free cash flows, as you know that these free cash flows are used, I paid. 
as you know that these free cash flows are used for different purposes and one of the purposes is that we use these free cash flows for the valuations of the company so if we use them for the valuation of the company always remember the free cash flows to firm should be discounted using the weighted average cost of capital and resultingly what you would get is that you would get the value of firm and the value of the firm would actually be made up of the value of debt and the value of equity the value of the firm would actually be made up of value of debt and the value of equity that's what the value of the firm is going to be if i move a bit forward and if i discuss further so what next is there <laughs> okay so this is what we have right this is what we have now uh, so value of firm would be made up of value of equity and the value of debt. Now, when we talk about the free cash flows to equity, so the free cash flows to equity are calculated like this. You start off with a profit after tax. From the profit after tax, you do all those adjustments like whatever the non-cash expenses are that are added up. Whatever the investments are, they are deducted and end of the day, you end up getting the free cash flows to equity. What we do is that we discount the free cash flows to equity using the cost of equity. So in a discounted using the cost of equity, we resultingly end up getting the value of equity. Resultingly, what do we end up getting? We end up getting the value of equity, right? So we end up getting the value of equity. So what is this value of equity going to be? The value of equity is going to be uh, the, the total value. So like just in case if there is a scenario where you're being required to calculate the value of equity, you would have to actually go about it like this. So if there's anything about the free cash flows, do let me know. Okay, now the next situation is, uh, so I've discussed about the free cash flows to firm now. Okay, uh, one more thing, uh, which is, um, I don't know if you people are uh, part and parcel of my AFM community or not.
just a second plus. Okay, so uh, the next area uh, for this investment appraisal is about the modified internal rate of return. Uh, because a lot of the students, they were asking me about the modified IRR, which is the MIRR. Now, I am actually sharing with you people uh, one of the links of the community this is AFM community. Uh, please join this. So I want you people to join this because what I'm just going to do is I'm going to share uh, one of the videos. I will share one of the videos. Okay, I've shared one of the links to you people in the WhatsApp. And uh, on the basis of that link, what you could do is that you could uh, actually, um, there are different chapters within that video. So within that video, please refer to video on CBE, practice. So I would want each one of you to go about with that video. The reason being it's a very comprehensive video. And through that specific video, you will be able to get a good idea as to how exactly should you be um, should you be uh, doing these MIRR and it also has got shortcuts for a lot of things. Uh, there is a slight uh, addition to that video which should be done, which is um, uh, I am actually, I mean like for the black shawls option pricing model, the ACCA, they uh, made an amendment. And through that uh, amendment, what happens is that now it has become a bit more easier to uh, go about uh, calculating the uh, calculating the black shawl option pricing model situations so but i will actually be uh, sharing that video also so for this modified internal rate of return i would want you people to go about and review the video uh, that i have shared uh, using this specific uh, um, uh, that, that is actually part and parcel of the whatsapp group where i have shared it so you can, uh, you can go and you can just uh, explore that video and you'll be able to see. AFM.
Okay, so I have uh, shared with you people the video in the different AFM groups that I have. Some are groups made by myself, some are the groups that I don't know whose group is that, but I'm actually part of that group, so I've just added up that to it also. So that maybe you can just benefit out of it. Okay, so we uh, the modified internal rate of return is another area which you would focus upon. Now let's move a bit forward and let's uh, discuss further. There's this another area which is uh, in the syllabus and that is called the duration. That is called the duration. The duration is also called Macaulay duration. The duration also calls the Macaulay duration. Now, how do we actually go about calculating the duration? So I will have a discussion with you people and I would demonstrate to you that how would you be calculating the duration? So let's just take an example that, uh, for example, uh, there is a project that has got cash flows like this, um, zero, one, two, three, and four. So there's a project that has got the cash flows like this. And if it has got cash flows like this, let's say 20,000, let's say 8,000, um, let's say 12,000, let's say 4,000, let's say 2,000. Now what happens is that the VAC that you have is 12%. The VAC that you have is 12%. So the first thing that you have to do is that you have to calculate the present value of these cash flows. You have to calculate the present value of these cash flows. How would you calculate the present value of these cash flows? Obviously, you would have to have the discount factor. So if I talk about the discount factor, it is going to be like uh, 1.08, uh, sorry, 1.0, 1 1.12 uh, power minus zero, 1.12 power minus one, 1.12 power minus two, 1.12 power minus three, 1.12 power minus four. I could have used Excel also, but I intentionally am I using this. So what happens is that at time period zero, you have an outflow of 20,000. At time period one, you have an uh, you have an inflow which has a present value of 7143. Then you have got nine five six six. Then you have got two eight four seven. And then you have got one two seven one. So first of all, if you have to calculate the duration, in order to calculate the durations, there are different steps that you have to follow that you have to adapt. The first step is that you need to have the present value of the cash flows. That's number one step. The step number two is that you have to multiply, you have to multiply these present value with the year. So let's say for example, this is gonna be multiplied by one, multiplied by zero. It's gonna be multiplied by one, multiplied by two, multiplied by three, multiplied by four. So when you do this, so what is gonna happen? I repeat, when you do this, what is gonna happen? What is gonna happen is that this would remain zero. This would remain zero. Then 7143 into one gives you 7143. Then what actually happens is that 9566 into two gives you 19132. 2847 into three gives you 8541. 1271 into four gives you 5084. So that was the step number two. Now what do you need to do? You need to actually sum up all of this. You need to establish the sum of all this. And what you need to do is that you need to sum up all of this. Once you will actually sum up all of this, what will we do next? I'll just explain to you. You need to establish the sum of all of this also. So if I calculate the sum of all this, the sum is going to be 7143 plus 9566 plus 2847 plus 1271 gives you 20,827. 
This is a step number three and a step number four. And this sum is going to be 7143 plus 19132 plus 8541 plus 5084. So this is going to be 39,900. This is going to be 39,900. Now, if you want to calculate the step number five is going to be to calculate the duration. Step number five is to calculate the duration. And how do you calculate the duration? The duration is going to be sum of PV into year divided by sum of the present value. So it's like 39,900 divided by 20,827. 20,827. Hence, 1.916 years. 1.96 years. So this is actually going to suggest to you the average time that would be required to recover to recover the initial investment average time required to recover the initial investment that is what the duration is going to be i mean that is what the duration is going to be the average time which is required to recover the investment that's what the duration is going to be Okay, does it make sense now? Okay, so this is the duration. It is the average time which is required to recover the initial investment. Uh, and this is established in terms of the present value. That is what the duration is going to be. I bet mean, that is what the duration. Okay, 20,827 is the sum of the present values. So like there are these five steps. What are those five steps? The steps are like this. You have to establish the present value of the cash flows. Then you have to establish the present value multiplied by number of year. Uh, then the third thing is that you have to um, you have to calculate the sum of the present values. You have to calculate the sum of the present value and the uh, sum of the present value and the uh, and the sum of the present value into year. You need to compare them so you get the duration in terms of number of years. So you get the duration in terms of number of years. So this is another technique and usually the students, they struggle with this technique also. So I thought that I would go about uh, discussing this specific technique also. Now let's move a bit forward and let's take things further. So the next aspect that I wanted to discuss about is the international investment. Level. Yeah, year zero will be excluded because it would automatically become zero. These are the sum of cash flows from return phase only. These are some of the cash flows from the return phase also. There is international investment appraisal. Now when we talk about this international investment appraisal, If we talk about the international investment appraisal, so there are uh, there are few different methods of doing this international investment appraisal. There are two ways of dealing with the international investment appraisal scenario. One of them is convert all 
foreign currency cash flows into local currency and then what you need to do is that you need to discount using you need to discount using the risk adjusted local vac so that's one of the approaches which is to convert all the foreign currency cash flows into the local currency and then discount using the local currency vac the second thing is that uh, cash flows are left to cash flows are not converted a foreign vac used to discount cash flows and establish foreign currency npv converted to local currency using spot rate so what happens is that let's say i'll just give you an example let's say you are based in uk and you invest in let's say uh, uae so now uh, one approach is that the aed is being converted to gbp and then you discount the gbp the other approach is that you let the aed be in the aed discount them and calculate the npv in aed and then convert to gbp the npv so that's another approach but generally speaking the examiner the data that he gives we usually adopt this approach we usually adopt this approach which is the adopt the, the approach of converting all the cash flows into the local currency using the relevant exchange rates and after the conversion we discount them using the relevant cash flows so hence resultingly we get it like this now a very important thing is that with respect to it um, you have to actually establish the forward exchange rates so let's talk about the forward exchange rate the forward exchange rates could be calculated using interest rate parity or could be calculated using purchasing power parity how what's the difference between this interest rate parity and the purchasing power parity okay you'll just get it again don't worry so major difference between the purchasing power parity and the interest rate parity is that with respect to the interest rate parity as the name suggests we mainly rely on interest rates with respect to the purchasing power parity it's the inflation that we usually rely upon so depending upon what the examiner has given you you would be calculating accordingly so the forward rate is established like this you say spot rate multiplied by 1 plus interest local currency divided by 1 plus interest foreign currency using the purchasing power parity theory the forward rate is established like this you say spot rate multiplied by 1 plus inflation local divided by 1 plus inflation foreign now for example what happens is that if the exchange rate is dollar upon uh, pound so what happens is that you would use the usa rates in the numerator and you would use the uk rates in the denominator if the if the if the exchange rate is written like this pound upon euro so you would use the uk inflation in the numerator and you would use the euro rate in the denominator that's what you would do i'll be that's what you are actually going to do
Okay, so this is how you go about doing this um, uh, doing this international investment appraisal. Uh, because you see, you have to consider now because the interest rate parity is the underlying concept. So the interest rate parity usually the forward rates are established using the interest rate parity. So the underlying concept is usually the interest rate parity. It's none other but the interest rate parity. Okay, now next uh, that I want to talk about is basically um, there is also the different sources of finance that we use. I mean, there are different sources of finance also that we use. So uh, with respect to those different sources of finance that we use, there is one uh, specific which is the Islamic finance. I have prepared a video on that. I will uh, share that video to you. Uh, so what I would recommend to you people is that you can use the video on that international uh, the Islamic finance and you could get a bit of an idea about how the Islamic finance would operate. So just in case that if you come across a question, so you could be able to do that. Uh, just allow me a minute. I'll just share that video. Uh, those who have joined in a bit late in the community, I am sharing that video again. Sorry for uh, sending it again. Those who have already been there. Allah, Islamic fire. Okay, so I've shared that also so that you could have an idea that, okay, how do we go about it? Uh, there are some students who are messaging me, but I'm sure that you won't be able to get any response from me right now because I can do one thing at a time. I can either uh, focus here on the class. Okay, you want me to share the link in the chat box too? Okay. Everyone. This is one video. There's this another video that was about the CB practice platform. So I'm gonna be sharing that also. I've shared both of the links here in the chat box also with you people. Yeah. So now next uh, we uh, need to talk about another aspect which is about the concept of dividend policy. 
So at times what happens is that the examiner uh, require examiner gives you a question on the uh, on the dividend policy. So as a student, uh, you might actually get stuck that okay, how would I go about doing the dividend policy thing? So okay, I will answer your questions, Tanisha Powell. Just wait a bit. Now, huh? example cash inflow. Sometimes we have to raise the number by T, and sometimes you don't. Why do we do it? Okay, just wait a bit. Now, when you talk about the dividend policy, uh, with respect to the dividend policy, there are different factors to consider. Now, what are those different factors that are to be considered? One of them is about your legal position as an entity. That what is your legal position? Can you pay off the dividend? Can you not pay off the dividend? Uh, the profitability, obviously the cash flows that the business has, plus in addition to this, uh, the uh, the tax impact, the shareholder groups, how they are, uh, the market segments in which you are operating in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are different different factors that you can understand. The examiner at times requires you to calculate the dividend capacity of the entity. So, when I talk about the dividend capacity of the entity, so the dividend capacity of the entity simply means that you have to calculate the free cash flows to equity because you know this thing that dividend free cash flows to equity is the amount available to be paid to equity providers. It's the amount that is available to be paid to the equity providers. That is what is considered to be the dividend capacity. So at times, the examiner might actually ask you a question saying that calculate the dividend capacity. So if he says calculate the dividend capacity, you now understand what do you mean by calculating the dividend capacity? You know this concept. Now let's move a bit forward and let's discuss further. Uh, there are different types of dividend policies that the entities can have. We're gonna talk about those dividend policies also, that what could be the different dividend policies that the entities could have. So one of them is having a stable dividend policy. Having a stable dividend policy. What do you mean by having a stable dividend policy? This would actually mean either you have got a constant dividend which is paid every year, or you have got a dividend which is constantly growing each year. So these could be the case. You could have a constant dividend or you could have a constantly growing dividend. Uh, that, 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 that's how it is. Um, the second thing is that you can have a constant payout ratio. What do you mean by having a payout ratio? The payout ratio means you would say profit multiplied by a certain percentage. Maybe let's say 20%, maybe let's say 25% whatsoever. So you have decided that whatever the profits are going to be, we are going to be distributing this much amount of the profits uh, for the benefit of the shareholders. Then you talk about the number three, which is called the zero dividend policy. So a lot of companies, they don't go about having any dividends because what happens is that they are either in the growth phase or maybe uh, the shareholders prefer the shareholders prefer capital gains. So that could also be the case. So at times what could happen is that your shareholders, they might not, they might not uh, prefer to have, I paid your shareholders, they might not prefer to have this uh, dividends. They might prefer to have the capital gains. They wanna realize the gains on their own whenever they think that it is feasible to realize the gains. So there could actually be a requirement or from the perspective of the shareholders also, the shareholders can have their own uh, preferences and on the basis of their own preferences, the shareholders could decide that how is it actually going to be. Uh, then what happens is that there is another policy which is called the concept of residual dividend policy. Now, what do we mean by residual dividend as the name suggests? So residual dividend is that uh, you would uh, meet all business needs. So the surplus that you would have, you would pay that out as a dividend. The surplus that you would have, you would pay that out as a dividend. 
that is what the policy is going to be. So that's also one thing that you would actually come across. So depending upon what the situation is, depending upon how the entity is operating, the entity would go about uh, going for this, um, uh, the entity would go about having a dividend policy. Now, there are alternatives to dividends. What are these alternatives to the dividend? One of the alternatives to the dividend is the bonus issue, which we also call the script dividend. So at times a company, they might not have the cash flows available. So when the company is struggling for cash, so if the company is struggling for cash, what would the company try to do? The company would try to see that, okay, I am actually struggling for the cash. So, uh, and the shareholders want a dividend. So just give them free shares. Just give them free shares. So if they want, if they want something, they can sell the shares. And earn their dividends. So they could sell the shares and they could earn their dividends. That is something that they could do. <laughs> There is another uh, thing which is called share buyback. Now the share buyback is not just the is not just the alternative to the dividend. There are multiple factors, multiple reasons for the entity entering into a share buyback. Generally, when we talk about the concept of share buyback, the share buyback is actually what the share buyback is that the entity is going to repurchase its shares. The entity is going to repurchase its shares. There are multiple reasons for that. Uh, they want to enhance the EPS. And obviously, when the EPS is enhances, the share price also enhances. So at times, what happens is that the companies, they want to uh, enhance their EPS. So if the EPS goes up, the share price also goes up. That's something that they can actually do. Now, what next is there? The next situation is, at times, uh, the share buyback is also to uh, increase holding uh, for distributing dividends also. Now you would say that how would, how would share buyback lead to distribution of dividend? How would share buyback lead to distribution of dividend? Let's just try to see this. For the distribution of the dividend, what the shareholders could be done is that, let's say the market value of the company's share is $20, and the company offers to buy back the company's shares for $32. So technically, this $12 difference is the dividend that the company is paying. How? Because the shares are going to be bought back from the own shareholders. The shares are going to be bought back from the own shareholders. And if the shares are going to be bought back from the own shareholders, so the own shareholders are getting this $12 extra in respect in lieu of in lieu of the shares that they are surrendering. So what is it going to be termed as? It is going to be termed as dividend. So technically, it is dividend. Technically, it is dividend. Why is technically this is dividend? The reason being that you are, what are you doing? You are actually uh, taking out the money, right? You're taking out the money, but the money is being taken out in the form of what? The money is being taken out in the form of uh, the share buyback. So you're actually transferring extra money to the shareholders. And this is a way of transferring money. This is a share buyback. Mm -hmm.
just a second ah الله I'll just take two minutes break. I'm gonna resume in two minutes time. Okay, now next is basically another concept, which is called the concept of, which is called the concept of transfer pricing. What is this transfer pricing all about? Transfer pricing is basically uh, the prices charged for the exchange of, the prices charged for the exchange of goods and services, for the exchange of goods and services, within a group, right? Within a group. So generally what happens is that if this is parent entity, this is subsidiary, the goods that are transferred between the parent and the subsidiary, whatever the price that is being charged, that is going to be considered as a transfer price. So what actually happens is that when we talk about the international companies, let me just guide you. When we talk about the international companies, so the international companies, what they do is that um, the international companies, they have got uh, entities which are, I mean, like they have got, um, they have got presence in multiple geographical location, location A, location B, location C. There could be multiple places where it could have a locate, geographical presence. So generally what happens is that when they have got these presences, so they might actually have to transfer the money uh, from all of these locations into one specific location. So usually what happens is that the taxes are applicable on these dividend transfers. At times what happens is that there is a withholding tax applicable. At times what happens is that there is this uh, tax on recipient that is applicable. So a lot of companies, what they do is that they uh, try to transfer through
purchase of goods. Now try to see what is. For example, this is company A, this is company B. A normally sells a product for $10. So that means B is gonna pay ten dollar. B is gonna pay ten dollar, right? Now what next is there? Instead of selling it for ten dollar, you might actually price it for seventeen dollar. So it's actually gonna be seventeen dollar that's transferred. Now, the seven dollar extra is the dividend that is transferred through the price. The tax authorities are very vigilant with respect to these pricing that is being charged. What is being charged between this, right, entities. So that's what it is. You get my point? Right? Okay. Now, what I'll do now is that I will actually wait for you people to ask me the questions that you have. And I will actually answer those questions, whatever topics, whatever area that you have a talk question in. Just ask me a question and I will actually answer them. So I would, I, I would, I would uh, try to talk to you one by one. Uh, the first one I've got Abigail. Abigail, are you struggling with any specific area? Is there any specific thing that you want me to explain? Yeah, Abigail, is there any specific area that you want me to explain? Uh, yes, sir. Can you explain um, the steps to take when calculating interest risk? I'm having problems with that one. What what is it that you uh, having with the interest rate risk? What area? Uh, the basis. Yeah, what area like of the, the interest rate risk? Basis. Time. Okay. Most okay. The remaining the remaining yeah. basis and all that, right? Yes. Okay. Let me let me just guide you now. See what happens is that let's say the spot rate is. 7% and the interest rate futures, the interest rate futures are trading at uh, 92.10. The interest rate futures are trading at 92.10. The maturity of interest rate future is in six months. loan would be obtained in four months. Now try to understand what's happening. The spot rate is 7%. The interest rate future is trading at 92.10. You know the price of interest rate future is 100 minus R. It says the maturity of this interest rate future is in six months time. So this is actually going to mature in six months time. And whereas the loan which you are trying to hedge, you would be you would be obtaining that loan in four months' time. Now try to see. We have to we have to close the IRF position in four months. We have to close the IRF position in four months. First of all, try to understand that what is your hedge strategy. Whenever you are a borrower, so being a borrower, you have a risk that the interest rate would go up. Let's say it's 7% right now, you have a risk, it will become 9%. So if I say IRF price, if it is 100 minus R, so it is 93 right now and it will become 91, right? That's what you have. So when we try to create a hedge strategy, we try to keep the interest rate futures price in mind. It is expensive right now, so you should sell it 
and it is going to be cheaper later on so you should buy it so for the borrower the hedge strategy should always be sell now buy later i paid for the borrower the hedge strategy should always be sell now buy later that's what the hedge strategy is always going to be for the borrower so i repeat the hedge strategy for the borrower is going to be sell now buy later now if we talk about the basis basis one of them is going to be calculated now how would you calculate the basis now you would say spot rate <clears throat> the spot rate is 7% and you would say irf so irf is like 100 minus 100 minus 92.1 <clears throat> this would actually give you a difference of what 7.9% so you would have 0.9% as the basis which is calculated now and if i have to calculate the remaining basis in 4 months time So I would say this is time period zero right now. The maturity date is six months. The maturity date is six months, and we are talking about these four months. We are talking about these four months. So resultingly, what would happen is that Resultingly, what's going to happen is that the two months basis would remain. Two months basis would remain. Two months basis would remain. Right. So what we do do is that we would say zero point nine percent multiplied by two divided by six. and resultingly we would end up getting the remaining basis that's how you have to calculate the remaining basis. so this is how you would calculate the remaining basis because the basis is remaining for this two months period so hence what happens is that 0.9 divided by 6 multiplied by 2 so it's actually going to be 0.3% which is the remaining basis do you understand it now abigail Yeah, do you understand it now? Or is there yes, any sir, other I question? Yes, I understand it. Yeah. Yes, okay, I lovely. understand it. Thank you. Any other queries that you have? No, no queries. It's clear now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, who else has a query? Abdul Mubti. Next one is Abdul Mubti. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum assalam. Uh, sir, uh, I have a query uh, related to like uh, uh, futures theories uh, area. Like what? Uh, like I know how to uh, solve the question. Like, but I am confused on how. Uh, what is margin what is basis risk like when we write in theory so uh, the concept that is behind this scenario so i want to like understand about that matlab kya issue kya ho raha hai tumhe theory samajh nahi aa rahi hai tumhe concept samajh nahi aa raha hai ye ye asal mein dekhe question solve to karna aata hai sahi hai sab pata hai kya karna hai lekin basis risk jo hai wo uska maqsad kya hai wo jaise theory mein puch leta hai ki margin के बारे में बताओ बेसिस के बारे में बताओ वो डायरेक्टर को नहीं पता कि ये इसमें क्यों होता है फिर भर क्यों जाता है फ्यूचर में मार, मार्जिन का क्या मसला है तो ये जरा मुझे एक थोड़ा तो सा समझना था हाय हाय अच्छा चलो सही है ओके ओके सो आई मीन आई होप दैट आई एम एबल टू आंसर हिज क्वेश्चन करेक्टली one of them is is asking about the concept of basis risk that what is the basis risk i mean like he says i know how to calculate and all that but i don't know how to explain the concept of basis risk so let me just guide you see what happens is that 
uh, just right now I gave an example that 0.9 multiply by 2 divided by 6, we got the remaining basis to be 0.3%. So this is what we just calculated right now. Now my question to you is that, is it is it always going to happen? The answer is no. I mean, we assume that 0 to 6. We assume that if it was 0.9% basis between this time period, so we assume that slowly, gradually, slowly, gradually, slowly, gradually, it would reduce, 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 and reduce. It is going to reduce in equal proportions. But the basis risk is actually the concept that the basis may not move as expected. You have made the calculation thinking, oh, after three, after four months, uh, the remaining basis would be 0.3. So this is what the difference would be between the spot rate and the price of interest rate future. But in practical, in reality, this is not the case. In reality, it is going to be something else. So the concept of basis risk is that we don't know what is it going to be, right? You get my point. So... This is what it is. Now, the next situation is about the margin. Now, what is the concept of this margin? So generally speaking, there is something called margin call. We also say there's something called margin trading. I'll explain to you what this margin trading is going to be. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, like we live in Pakistan, there is a PSX, the Pakistan Stock Exchange. In Pakistan Stock Exchange, there is usually uh, caps. Let's say 7.5% upper cap, 7.5% lower cap. What does it mean? That if there is a share which is worth 100 rupee, its price in a single day could maximum become 107.5 or its price in a single day could become 92.5. So there is an upper cap and there is a lower cap. There is an upper cap and there is a lower cap. Let's say, let's say I uh, want to trade. And my broker, the stock broker has allowed me to trade on margin. When you trade on margin, so on the basis of margin, what you do is that you pay interest. Now, what is this margin all going to be? See, uh, let's say, the broker is going to ask me, okay, let's deposit 100,000 with us. This is called initial margin. Now, if I say 100,000, and if I divide it by 7.5, so 100,000 divided by 7.5, 100,000 divided by 7.5, is going to be 13,333 shares. That means the 100,000 rupee that I have deposited, I can actually cover up the losses on one, three, triple three shares. So my broker, what he would do is that he would only allow me to trade this many number of shares because he would say that the margin that you have deposited, this margin could actually allow you to, uh, to, to, to have this much exposure. Now, what would happen is that, let's say, I purchase 20,000 shares. And when I purchase these 20,000 shares, there is actually a loss. Just a second. Huh? Okay, so let's say you bought 20,000 shares and you lost 7.5 on it. That means your loss is 150,000. So the broker, what is he going to do? He's going to say that deposit 50,000. This is going to be called margin call. And next day, when you would go to the broker and you would ask him that I want to trade, he would say, give me more money before you can trade. So margin concept is that, the concept of margin is that 
the margin is the is the additional amount that you pay just to make sure that you are able to trade just to make sure that you are able to trade abdul mubti is this clear now i mean like i don't know if i've been able to uh, specifically explain what you were looking for but i thought maybe i just yes sir clear now like i have a view uh, of this now thank you sir okay you have any other query no sir no okay Mo, um <coughs> we have got uh, bbli bbli uh, do you have any queries to ask not the present sir okay lovely so how's the preparation um so i'm, I'm still unsure whether i should go to write the exam or not. Oh, I would suggest go to write the exam. I mean, like, there's no point in missing the examination. Just don't uh, panic. Uh, just try to make sure that you, uh, I mean, like, if, if you have not prepared well, uh, uh, so just try to do that. You do at least two questions, uh, two past paper, two past papers, complete past papers today, and you would be able to get a good insight onto how to attempt the paper and just go to the examination thinking you have nothing to lose. Okay. Will right do. just just don't uh, i mean like uh, don't panic because the more you panic it's going to be very very difficult so just don't panic because if you have already given up right now so i think you don't have anything to lose tomorrow just go out just go all out there just attempt the paper okay i will thank you sir thank you thank you okay i've got benolo mabutho Benola Mabuto, you have got any queries? Uh, sir, can you please explain currency swaps? Okay. Like fixed variable currency swaps. Okay. See, what happens is that when we talk about the currency swaps, usually the examiner, he, uh, he does not ask you about the currency swaps only. He talks about the cross-currency interest rate swaps generally. But let me just uh, explain to you the currency swap. Uh, there is a question Linda uh, Linda has also identified in the that's worthy goal. That's a very good question on the swap also. But let me just explain to you what this swap means. Let's say you are in UK and you're investing in you're investing in India. Um, so that means you got to transfer the money to India. So the pound sterlings are going to be sent from UK into India and they're going to be converted into INR. And when you will be reverting back the money, so the INR would be sent and they would be converted into pound sterling in UK. So generally what happens is that uh, when this pound is converted to INR and when this INR is converted to pound, there are there are basically multiple things that you face. One of them is the margin or which we call the spread the difference between the buying and the currency selling rates and you know you are always on the losing end transaction cost at times taxes etc etc so there are multiple costs that you face so when you face all these multiple costs so what you want to do is that you want to avoid these costs and you want to avoid these margins so what you do is that you try to identify a company in India which has got a business in UK. So basically, this Indian company needs to send money to UK and you want to send money to India. So what would happen is that you and that company would agree an exchange rate uh, for GBP to INR. You would agree to an exchange rate. And when you would agree to an exchange rate, so what you would do is that you would actually, you being a UK company will give pound sterling to the Indian subsidiary and the Indian subsidiary would give INR to the UK company subsidiary. So that's how you're gonna exchange, you're gonna enter into a swap. That's how you're gonna enter into a swap, which is the exchange of cash flows one stream of cash flows is another. 
the exchange rate is usually fixed. Now, a lot of companies, what they do is that they enter into a long-term swap. And that long-term swap is usually for the initial investment, for the profit, for the initial investment, for the profit, for the uh, residual cash flow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they would enter into a long-term swap on that basis. They would enter into a long-term swap on that basis. Do you get this concept of swap now? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you want more uh, insight into it? No, it's fine, sir. That's the, that's the part that okay. was kind of confusing, so, like okay. understanding what it is. Uh -huh. Okay. So you have any other queries? No, you sir. Have any I'm other good. queries? Is there any other queries no, that sir. you have? No, I'm good. Okay, lovely. Uh, please allow me one minute. Allow. <laughs> And next, I have got Boba So. Uh, is it Boba? I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. I'm sorry about it. Boba So, that's what I can pronounce. I don't know. Uh, yeah? Hello, hello, yes. Yes, is uh, the short name. Yeah, it's Boba So. That's correct. I'm fine. Thanks. So, what's what's your query now? Right. Uh, well, um, I am focusing at the moment uh, on the theory part, reading um, the theory because I um, I think that I am behind on the theory. For example, when they ask about advantages and disadvantages on different topics. So, uh, yes, um, other than that, I'm okay. I don't think I am quite ready for this exam. I will give it a go, but I think by March, this tomorrow will be a learning curve for me, I think. And uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, <laughs> uh, what I would actually suggest to you is that just like what I suggested to the other lady also, that yeah. uh, you have nothing to lose. After all, you're not going to be getting refund of the money that you have paid. So my yeah. suggestion to you is going to be that go all out. Don't uh, miss the chance. And uh, I mean, like um, yeah, this final, I mean, like whatever time that you have up till the examination, just try to make sure that um, you uh, you cover up uh, some, at least two pass papers if you can. Uh, complete two pass papers, latest pass papers if you can. Uh, just uh, release the pressure for yourself. And... Um, for the theory part, which you are saying that you are struggling, let me just see if I can share something with you. Wait a bit. I think I have got something. Wait a bit. Um, I'll be good.
Okay. <coughs> You're part of the WhatsApp group, right? Yes. Okay, I've sent something to you people in the WhatsApp group. Uh, I hope you will just receive it in a minute's time. Has anyone received it yet? Yeah, just a second. I don't know my WhatsApp just uh, uh, crashed a bit. Just a minute. Every passing day. the amount of information that is being shared over whatsapp seems like you need to buy a new cell phone every 2 months <laughs> wow Okay. Right now we have it. Receive now. Yes. Okay, it's received twice, right? Yes. Okay. See, if you would just look at these notes, these notes yeah. actually have got. Uh, these notes have got. Uh, the advantages and disadvantages of a lot of things so just a quick scream uh, skim through you don't have to do anything if you are just struggling with advantages disadvantages that's how you have to do all right okay thank you right that's good thank you
या हुसैन प्लीज गो एड असलाकुम सर सर कैन आई स्पीक इन उर्दू इफ पॉसिबल बोलो 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 को मसला नहीं बोलो अच्छा अच्छा सर सीन ये है कि मैंने आप यानी कि फुल टाइम स्टूडेंट इनरोल था और मैंने मन आपकी लास्ट मंथ में क्लासेस वगैरह लेना शुरू की थी और आई वाज डूइंग वेरी तो मेरा यानी कि ये सीन हुआ था कि ना क्योंकि मैंने ऑडिट का भी पेपर देना था ट्रिपल ए का ना तो मुझे ये था कि मेरा सही यानी कि ना बॉन्ड वैल्यूएशन इंटरनेशनल इन्वेस्टमेंट अप्रेजल तक ना जो मेरी आप सारे लेक्चर थे ना इवन क्वेश्चन वो मैं साथ साथ सारे मैंने अच्छी तरह समझ के किए थे ना क्लासेज में तो प्राइसिंग ब्लॉक चेंज ये सारी चीजें अलहमदिल्ला मेरी ग्रिप में है तो फिर मेरा एट द एंड हा के ना क्योंकि मुझे ट्रिपल ए की वजह से उसको चार पाँच दिन देने थे तो ये वो मैं तो पेपर दिया था मेरा फोर्टीज में रुका था तो ये मैं फर्स्ट टाइम दे रहा था तो फिर मुझे कहा कि एक ब्रेक लेना पड़ा यहाँ पे ना मुझे ये मैंने किया कि जो आपके वैल्यूएशन मर्चर एक्विजिशन और जो था ना इंटरेस्ट रिस्क मैनेजमेंट फिर मैंने जो कंसेप्टेक्चर है वो ले लिए थे लेकिन जो प्रैक्टिस वाले क्वेश्चन थे ना वो मैंने नहीं लिए और मैंने सही उसका है ये मैंने उसका ये प्लान किया था कि जब मेरा ट्रिपल ए का पेपर होगा ना उसके बाद मेरे तीन दिन होंगे तो मैं जो पहला आधा दिन है ना उसमें ये करंसी रिस्क मैनेजमेंट जो कि बिल्कुल मैंने छोड़ दिया था और इंटरेस्ट रिस्क मैनेजमेंट ना उसको आके किसी लेक्चर लेके ना कवर करूंगा कि अपनी अंडरस्टैंडिंग बनाऊंगा लेकिन बाय वो लग के नहीं क्या हुआ कि मेरा उधर ना क्योंकि आई एम इन ओमान ना मैं ओमान के अंदर हूँ तो ट्रिपल ए का पेपर ना वो सेंटर पे कोई डिले आ गया तो वो फर्स्ट हाफ में मेरा हुआ नहीं वो उन्होंने टू पी पे करना था लेकिन टू पी पे भी नहीं हुआ वो जा के ना साढ़े तीन बजे शुरू हुआ तो वो मैं शाम को छः साढ़े छः फारे हुआ जिसकी वजह से मेरा सारा जो मोमेंटम प्लान था ना वो पूरा डिस्टर्ब हुआ तो वो फिर अगले तीन तो मैं जो मेरा प्लान चाह रहा था और जो कुछ था ना तो मैं उसको प्रॉपर एग्जीक्यूट नहीं कर सका तो राइट ना मैंने क्या के देना है और मुझे जो फुल कॉन्फिडेंट है कि अगर उन टॉपिक्स में आ गया तो मैं आराम से उनको टैकल कर सकता हूँ अभी भी जब आप आपका लेक्चर सुन रहा था ना जो चीजें आप है ना वो मुझे समझ आ रही थी कि अच्छा जैसे बॉन्ड वैल्यूएशन है मुझे उस पर पूरी ग्रिप है फ्री कैश फ्लोज है ट्रांसफर है ब्लैक शॉल्स है और आज मैंने जो वैल्यूएशन मैंने टॉपिक आपसे पहले अंडरस्टैंड किया हुआ था लेकिन उसका सवाल कैसे करना है मैंने अभी बैठ के उसका पूरा मार्च जून का ना जो पहला सवाल था ना वैल्यूएशन वाला वो पूरा मैंने किया उसको समझा और वो मुझे स्पीक हो गया था कि अच्छा ये कैसे होना है ना तो वो मुझे अब ये भी कौन वैल्यूएशन वाला भी ना सवाल अगर आ गया ना तो मैं उसका सेवेंटी एटी करना मैं उसको कर सकता हूँ और ये सारी चीजें क्या ना इस जो मुझे बिल्कुल जिसमें मैं रही है मैं ब्लैंक खड़ा जस्ट मैंने आपको इससे कॉल बात कर रहा हूँ ताकि आप मुझे उस पर इनपुट दें मैं ये नहीं कहना अभी चार पाँच छः घंटे इजीली पढ़ सकता हूँ बाकी ये नहीं कहना लेकिन मेरा ये है कि मुझे जो इंटरेस्ट रिस्क मैनेजमेंट और करेंसी रिस्क मैनेजमेंट है ना उस पर मुझे कॉन्फिडेंस नहीं आ रहा है कि उसके सवाल को कैसे टैकल करना है सही है ओके ओके मैं आपको कुछ चार क्वेश्चन बता रहा हूँ ठीक चार है क्वेश्चन कर लो मुझे सर एक मिनट दीजिएगा वेट करो जी टेंशन सर आप नहीं लो टेंशन नहीं लो बिल्कुल अच्छा टेंशन नहीं लो ठीक है अबे तो मैसेज करते ना तो मुझे अल्लाह के बंदे ग्रुप में मैसेज करते तुम तो लोग भी था ना बिल्कुल सुन मैं लो तो, तो मैसेज करते थे यार ग्रुप में सही है इंडिविजुअल मैसेज का मैं जवाब नहीं देता हूँ यूजुअली क्योंकि मेरे पास अभी मेरे मोबाइल पता नहीं कितने हजारों मैसेज जनरेट पड़े हुए अब क्या करें यार कैसे जवाब अभी मैं यहाँ पे मैंने जो कम्युनिटी में मैसेजेस सर्कुलेट करा था ना तो पीछे से बच्चे मुझे प्राइवेट में मैसेज कर रहे थे अब वो ये समझ रहे कि अभी बैठा हुआ है जवाब देगा अब मैं यहाँ थोड़ी जवाब दे सकता हूँ अभी ओके ना एनी वेज लेट सी सी वट आई एम एक्चुअली सजेस्टिंग टू यूज दैट यू गो टू दीज लेक्चर्स ऑन द इंटरेस्ट रेट रेस्क मैनेजमेंट ऑन द वेब पोर्टल पिक अप दिस क्वेश्चन आवान हाँ कंपनी ये मैंने लेक्चर क्वेश्चन इलेवन आवान कंपनी नंबर वन नंबर टू दिस ठीक है वर्दी गुल कंपनी दैट्स नंबर टू क्वेश्चन राइट एंड नंबर थ्री क्वेश्चन ठीक है इज फिट्स हैरिस Try to do these three questions. Just, just look at my video slowly, gradually, and just try to understand what I'm up to in these two. Like three, three questions plus for the currency risk management. Uh, do this Kanduri company. ठीक है 
डू दिस इनफैक्ट दिस कैंडोरी कंपनी हैज गॉट मल्टीपल स्टेप्स हां दीस आर मल्टीपल मल्टीपल इज ब्रोकन डाउन देन डू दिस दिस बोल लीरियो कंपनी आइडियली लीरियो एंड कैसा सोफिया द कैसा सोफिया हैज गॉट टू वीडियोस 19 एंड 21 so like uh, it will be like 2 okay. 2 and a half hours for interest rate 2 to 2 and a half hours for currency risk just try to do these questions maybe you could even play the video at 1.5 also but just try to take the grip of what i am doing theek hai theek hai so so this is ye bas ye kar lo tum abhi aur kuch nahi karo ye kar theek hai aur ye sir ek cheez thodi si confusion hai yani ke jo hamara valuation aur merger and acquisition hai उसका मोस्ट पास पेपर के जो रीसेंट है दो एक सवाल कर ली है कोई आपके आप सवाल सजेस्ट कर सकते हो कि जो कि आप मैंने कराया था आपने अटेंड की थी क्लास कल मैंने कराया था आपने अटेंड करी थी क्लास हां नहीं कल नहीं मैंने कल वाली नहीं अटेंड की आपने वो मार्क वाला कराया था आज आपने किया वो वाला कराया था वो कोई मैंने कर लिया था बस वो अच्छा है वो देख लो हां अब वो मैंने कर लिया उसमें यानी कि चीजें समझ ली हैं तो उसके अलावा और कुछ उसके में करने की जरूरत नहीं है वैल्यूएशन में नहीं 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 बस बहुत है और बाकी वैल्यूएशन रीस्ट्रक्चरिंग ये सारे क्वेश्चंस एक साथ ही आते हैं चलो बस ठीक है इंशाल्लाह सर मैं हाई विल ट्राई माय बेस्ट कि किसी तरह मैं ना पेपर को इंशाल्लाह ना टैकल करूं बट बट आई मीन लाइक यू सी फॉर एवरी अदर पर्सन हु इज इन हियर फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल अपॉलॉजीज टू दोस हु आर एक्चुअली नॉट एबल टू अंडरस्टैंड व्हाट वी वर टॉकिंग अबाउट सो ऑब्वियसली एवरीवन इज कंफर्टेबल टॉकिंग इनटू देयर मदर टंग so uh, he is again i mean like he has covered up a significant portion but he could not uh, cover up the areas of uh, these practice questions a lot so he was just asking that what can i do in these last few moments so again my suggestion just like i've been suggesting to all of you is that just give all out because you see what happens is that a lot of students they fail because they have a fear of failing so the moment uh, you don't have any fear of failing you will be able to get through you see i tell something uh, to uh, my uh, i mean like uh, i i usually give this example that the best time to give an interview is when you don't need a job right <laughs> if you don't need a job you can just go on and just uh, enjoy the interview and you usually get selected in that time so the best time to give an interview is when you don't need a job similarly the best uh, way i mean like the best approach of attempting an examination is that when you don't fear failing if you have a fear of failing you can never pass just take out the fear and just go with an approach okay so what if i'm going to fail so what so that actually automatically releases the pressure there is always a next time that automatically releases the pressure and that enhances the confidence so that's what i would always suggest you people to do no matter whatever the circumstances is uh, obviously i mean like um, see um, you you should have you should have you should have spent more time earlier if you didn't that that's an that's an error on your part but now uh, instead of skipping the examination not going into the examination you would get nothing out of it you get the point just go out attempt the paper and uh, and try to attempt the paper and just try to make sure that uh, you make the most out of that and when you never know i i remember i attempted the sbl i mean like it used to be p3 earlier i'd never take i'd not taken any tuitions of that paper plus uh, i was not uh, i mean like i uh, during the whole Uh, period that that used to be a six month time and during this whole time period i was actually uh, thinking that i would study 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 and one last day before the examination uh, i said that this is a very interesting paper inshallah i will prepare for it next time but you know what did i do in the last two three days i could not go through the book so what i did was that uh, i went through the revision kit past papers answers only and i said that okay what is the question is he asking and what is the answer he is saying and then i tried to just grasp the concept and you know what when i went into the examination there was some 30 mark question that i just didn't know i just didn't attempt and i attempted the rest of the 70% paper and i was having a severe headache in the examination like what the hell is it where am i why am i not able to do it 
But then I said, okay, next time. <laughs> and then I tried to write whatever I could write for those 70 marks. And you know what? I ended up passing at 56 marks. <laughs> that was the day. Uh, I never opened the P3 or the SBL book again. So, uh, so, 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 uh, so uh, you never know what's going to happen. Just go all out. Even if you know 60, 70%, maybe the exam might comes out of that 60, 70%. Maybe the 100% is tested out of that 60, 70%. After all, if there is a 100% examination, you don't attempt 20%. You only attempt 80% correctly, 80%. And out of that 80%, if you attempt 80% correctly, you get 64% marks. If you attempt 70% correctly, you get 56% marks. But if you attempt 60% correctly, you get 48% marks. So what you should try to do is that you should try to go for this 80-80. If not possible, then 80-70. That's what you should try to do. Give yourself confidence, even if I miss out. And nowadays, there are professional marks, 20 marks, professional marks. They're good marks to gain. You can gain good marks out of that. So that's what I would suggest. Right? I hope that it helps. Okay, if there's anyone else having any other question rather than me calling out names of each and everyone, you could just uh, go up. Sir, sir, can you, yes, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I hope, can. sir, you can recognize me. I uh, follow your uh, SBR lecture just before the exam, and Alhamdulillah, I got pass. Oh, so sure. I am yeah, I really remember. grateful. I am really grateful to you. And uh, the, today, when I uh, got the notification on WhatsApp, so that I think that I should uh, just uh, go with this uh, session so that I can learn at least anything new. Sir, uh, my uh, question is, uh, though it is very simple, mm, question uh -huh. is, uh, question one, uh, report. Uh, should I write a uh, report to board of director just this line or should I write the way I write on the AAA paper to from yes. subject date? Yes, yes, write, write the on, way you used to format. write in the AAA paper. And... Uh, I can say that, sir, uh, the problem, my problem is uh, like SBR, any paper, uh, I was uh, really much stressed on the exam. And due to the stress, I couldn't uh, think properly. There's the main drawbacks, main obstacles for my yeah. passing on the paper. Uh, I give uh, AFM second time this time. Uh -huh. And inshallah, I uh, finished almost all papers, all first papers, uh, kit solved, and I took uh, inshallah good grip on the topics. Uh -huh. So that I hope that if Allah will, then I can do my best. Everything depends uh -huh. on Almighty. Then I will uh -huh. do my. I give my best try. I hope you will uh -huh. pray for me, as like oh, inshallah, paper. inshallah, all prayers with you people, and I remember. Uh, if I if I am not wrong, you are not right now in Bangladesh. You are somewhere in Middle East, right? Uh, no, sir. I am uh, right in uh, Bangladesh now. You I, were in uh, Middle East and you went back to Bangladesh. Was that? Uh, no, 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 sir. I so I am you, in Bangladesh. Uh, okay, now. basically two things. Uh, uh, you, you attempted SBR multiple times and you could not clear yes, it. Then yes. you cleared. Was you are the same guy, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 And you cleared in that That's attempt right. when you had a, I mean, this was a similar type of a session one day before yes. the examination, right? Is that? Yes, 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 yes. Just in the way uh, today, just before the exam. Okay, I can recall I, our uh, conversation completely. Yes, yes sir. So uh, my, 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 my suggestion to you is again going to be the same, that just don't panic, right? I, I mean, I'm. it's just that uh, you just can't do anything at this last moment except for except for uh, focusing on some of the mistakes plus just don't panic just go into the examination uh, like others have done you can also do plus just like you have passed so many papers you can do this paper also so just relax a bit and just go ahead and uh, try to give your best that's that's what i can suggest to you sadik and 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 see there is a very simple rule if you don't understand just move on Yes, and one thing that I want you to remember is that with respect to these computational papers like AFM, 
So there are marks for every single steps that you do. So do yes, whatever sir. you can. Like even at times what happens is that we get stuck with the VAC calculation because we don't know how to calculate the KD in the given scenario. If you don't know how yes, to calculate KD in the given scenario, you know the other things how to calculate. So just calculate yeah. the other things. Take a hypothetical KD and just go about doing the VAC calculation. What will happen? You will lose marks for the KD only. You will not be losing marks for the you will not be losing marks for the application of the VAC and etc. You get my yes, point. Sir. So see yes. what happens is that the good thing is ACCA, it's not an MCQ paper right now. It's it's yes. a discursive, it's it's a paper that is being marked on every step, plus the theoretical aspect. It's it's a lot of students fail the AFM because they lack on theory. And yes. The best approach for the theoretical aspect is that in the examination, there are two types of theories. One of them is a bookish knowledge. The other one of them is the knowledge which is going to be applicable uh, using the information given in the uh, question. So just yes, try sir. to make sure that uh, you list down pointers for yourself. There is a scratch pad in the examination. So you list down the pointers for yourself or even if there is no scratch pad, just write it down on the word processing document. Uh, the pointers and then try to develop onto those pointers into the short paragraphs because a lot of the students what they do is that they just start writing that's not the way to do just think about four five six points whatever points that you want to think about just write down the points then elaborate each of the points into short 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 paragraphs that's that's the approach that you should adopt yes sir right yes sir thank you sir okay thank you all the best um, sadik Yes, thank you, sir. Okay. okay, is there anyone else having any other question, please? Anyone want to ask anything? Yeah, yes, sir. Uh good morning. Oh. Good. Uh, -huh. uh so when when up uh, it's Tanisha, when applying in inflation, for example, mm -hmm. like, like to cash, sometimes they will mm -hmm. uh, when I'm looking at questions, they will raise it to the number of years and sometimes they uh -huh. don't. Could you clarify why they do that and why they don't? Okay. Uh see. There could be there could be multiple scenarios. Let's say the examiner says the selling price for year one is expected to be twenty dollar. Are you sure in your screen? I'm still seeing the list. You cannot of see the screen. No, just you cannot the see the screen. screen. I'm not seeing the screen where you. Okay, yeah, you're right. I, it's not shared. Thank you. Okay, let's say the selling price for year one is $20. The prices are expressed in current terms. So what does it mean? In current terms actually means that if inflation is, is 4%, let's say. So for the year one, year two, year three, for the year one, you would say, dollar 20 multiplied by 1.04 for the year 2 you would say dollar 20 multiplied by 1.04 power 2 for the year 3 you would say dollar 20 multiplied by 1.04 power 3 there is an alternative way of doing it also which is you have 20 into 1.04 this actually gives you 20.8 so this year you say 20.8 multiplied by 1.04 gives you 21.632 that's another way so like one way is you can just go about doing this power 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 the second is you go about this that's one approach the second thing is that the examiner might actually say this is the second uh, situation now the examiner might actually say that the selling price for year one is $20 Prices are subject to inflation of four percent, and he does not express and he does not say anything. So you can write down in the assumptions that it is assumed dollar twenty is inflation adjusted 
is inflation adjusted price for year one. And then you could go about applying this. Let's say year one, it's 20. Year two, you would say 20 into 1.04. Do you get my point now? Yes. Right? Sometimes... Okay, now there is one more thing. One more thing. Mm -hmm. There could actually be situation that inflation could have been, could different could be different. Year one, inflation is 2%. Year two inflation is 5%, year three inflation is 4%. So if you wanna calculate the year three cash flow, you would say $1.20 into 1.02 into 1.05 into 1.04. Do you get it now? Yes, that, this is the one that I was concerned. The last one is the one that I was concerned about, like really uh -huh. needing some clarity about because why, because is it saying, for example, sometimes it would be different amounts. For example, they'd say in year mm. one, it is two, five, four. And year one cash flow is 50. The next one is 25. And the next one is 30. And then each of those, I'll have to do it. So, so and it says pre-inflation. The question would say, the see pre-inflation cash flows. And then they give you different inflation amounts. So I'm supposed to always do one. 20, this year, year one, 20 times 1.02, which would be for year one. Year uh -huh. two, 30 times 1.02 times 1.05. Yeah. Yeah. That's forth. how you do it. Yeah. That's how you do it. Okay. Right? That's how uh -huh. you do it. Okay. Uh, one more quick clarification I was asking. So for the interest rate for um exchange rate, whenever we have two different interest rate, whenever we're doing international um investment and we have two different mm -hmm. interest rate, we are always supposed to do what you had showed us earlier. Once we have two different inflation inflation rate, we should use the purchase power parity or inflation that those two. Yeah, the purchasing have... inflation inflation is the preference because what happens is that the forward exchange rates are ideally calculated using the Purchasing power parity, so that means that you have to use the inflation. Always. Okay. And my final question is, could you go over um, t uh, financing costs for mm -hmm. ABP? So the issue costs, the mm -hmm. issue costs, the, the tax shield, and the... Mm -hmm. Okay. The other one. Okay, Linda, you also had the same question. You also wanted to know about this uh, APV. You want a quick revision? So anyways, the APV, the adjusted present value, is an alternative to the investment, uh, is the NPV. Um, how do we calculate the APV? We say base case NPV plus present value of financing side effects. Now, when we talk about the base case NPV, this simply means NPV calculating using, using all equity rate. What do you mean by all equity rate? So there are two ways of having the all equity rate. One of them is basically using the CAPM and one of them is using the MM2. <clears throat> the MM2 formula is also given in the examination. So for the CAPM, you use KE is equivalent to risk-free rate of return plus instead of the equity beta, you use the asset beta. <clears throat> you use the asset beta. So instead of using the equity beta, you use asset beta. What do you use? You use asset beta, right? You use asset beta. So that's one thing. Now, when we talk about the present value of financing side effects, so there are different, number one of them is about the issue cost. So when you obtain loan, usually the loan issue cost is tax deductible. If you obtain finance using equity, that is usually not tax deductible. So let's say that you had an issue cost of dollar two million and the tax rate is 30%. So at time period zero, you would say, issue cost of $2 million is an outflow.
and you would say tax savings at 30% is 0 0.6. That 1.4 is the net amount that you would do. 1.4 is the net amount that you would do. That's one thing, right? <clears throat> Now, let's move a bit forward and um, the other aspects also. Now, what are those other aspects? Let's just try to see. The other aspect is basically, tax savings due to interest. Let's say the loan was $20 million at 8%. The tax rate is 30%. Loan term is four years. So what is the do? You will say that um, you'll say interest at 8% is 20 into 8%. gives you 1.6 million. The tax savings at 30% is 480,000. You would say four year annuity factor at 8%. So whatever that is going to be, and then you would get the present value of tax savings due to interest. You would end up getting the present value of tax savings due to interest, right? So that's one of the approaches. Now there is this third one last area. I should have actually done it. Okay. Now the third one of them is net interest saved on Subsidized loan, net interest saved on subsidized loan. When we talk about the net interest saved on subsidized loan, how do we go about it? Let's say that um, normal rate is 8%. Loan received at 3%. Tax rate is 30%. Loan amount is 20 million. So what will you do? You would say interest saved. 8% minus 3% multiplied by 20 million. Gives you 100,000 or let's say 1 million. Sorry, 1 million. You would say extra tax at 30%, 700,000 is that net interest saved, and then you would say four year annuity at 8%. So resultingly, what would happen is that you would end up getting this present value of financing side effects. Does it make sense now? Yes, yes, sir, it does. Uh, as there are two rates that they usually use. They are two. Yeah. You can take yeah. from two different types of rates. What are they called again? So it's the interest rate on the note, and what is the other one? 
Okay, so either the risk-free rate or the interest rate on the loan, rate, right? Mm -hmm. So I would suggest that use the KD, always use the KD. Okay, the cost of debt, okay. All right, thank you. Right, okay. Okay, who else is there? Is there any other query that you people have? Anyone having any other query, please? Yeah, anyone having any other query? Yes, yeah, so um, would the discount rates be on uh -huh. the subsidized loan or would it be on the um, original um, price or the original rates of um, your normal interest rates? Okay, I would suggest use the original rates. Okay, thank you. Okay, guys, so thank you very much, all of you. Thank you for attending the session at such a short notice. I hope that you all enjoyed the session. I hope that it was it was uh, it was valuable session for all of you. The recording of the session would also be made available. I'm just gonna make sure that it's just uploaded right now uh, uh, in the evening only so that you can get access to it. Uh, so thank you again for being here. Thank you again for joining in. I uh, hope you enjoyed the session.